So let's recall the setup from uh, yesterday. No, not yesterday. Wednesday. Uh, so we got G over QP, a reductive group. Um, and at some point, I will assume for simplicity that it's quasi-split. Um, also, <coughs> I fixed some algebraically closed base field. To work in a geometric setting. <coughs> and I was considering the stack bungee. I defined on the category of perfectoid spaces over K. Taking any test object S to uh, the groupoid of G torsors on XS, where this was a relative far from 10 curve. And so, um, I stated last time a theorem to the effect that uh, in a suitable interpretation of these words, this is a smooth Artin stack of dimension zero. Okay, and so uh, then I fixed my coefficients. So coefficients were O e mod L to the n, where e over Q L is a finite extension. <coughs> uh, of course, L is not P. And uh, so we had a Verdier duality functor. This category of <coughs> chiefs of lambda modules on Bungie to itself. Thanks. <laughs> Can't believe that Konsevich asked this question in Hot Gabber. <laughs> <laughs> So it maps it into the dualizing complex on Bungie. <coughs> and then we had this definition that F is reflexive uh, if F maps isomorphically to its double radio dual. And this was our substitute uh, for the notion of constructible sheaves on the sky, where the usual notion of constructibility would not be the good thing to consider. <coughs> and the main theorem I stated last time, which still had a star because it still depends on one conjecture. says the following, that you can completely understand when a sheaf is reflexive, so f d at bungee lambda is reflexive, <coughs> if and only if <coughs> for all points, and as I said last time, points on the stack are classified by Kotwitz's set B of G of isocrystals, 
and all cohomological degrees I. So this B somehow corresponds to a geometric point XB bar to bungee. Uh, for all such guys and all integers, um, <coughs> if I look at the stock of this, well, complex really, at uh, xb bar, then it's a complex, so I can look at all the cohomology groups. <coughs> These are all representations of the uh, corresponding automorphism group of this b, which is this. Uh, well, at least if G is quasi splits, it's this inner form of a levy of G, GB of QP, if this is an admissible representation. And so today I want to explain the proof uh, of this theorem. <coughs> and so the proof is by uh, by induction on bun G, which is somehow bounded by some fixed B. Okay, so. You somehow start uh, proving a similar result just on the same stable locus, and then you go further and further out into the non same stable locus, uh, one stratum at a time. <coughs> and so. Uh, There's sort of an abstract theorem behind this, that if this stack has no. this, this discrete set of points, so to speak. Okay, the question is whether there. Is this a special case of a more general theorem applying to more general sex? And I don't think so. I think it's really something very special for Bungie. At least you prove it for all sets in Bungie as well. Uh, yeah, so I proved the same theorem for all uh, open subsets of Bungie. Yeah. <laughs> and what but about things which are in some sense a tar of a Bungie? Or things which are tar of a Bungie. Uh, might be true. Maybe. <coughs> so for things which are very close to Bungie, it might still be okay, but... Um, okay. Uh, I don't Okay, I, I can tell. Um, certainly, the proof makes use of very special properties of Bungie. <coughs> so, uh, you start on the same as stable locus. And so what I've already uh, said last time, implicitly, is that it's this following theorem, uh, which for GLN is due to Kivali and Liu. And then for general G, uh, too far. Um, Uh, it says that um, if you look at Bungie and then you look at the same as stable locus, then <coughs> uh, this decomposes into a disjoint union over all basic B of a classifying space for <coughs> the corresponding inner form of G. Okay. 
And so uh, we have to understand <coughs> what this dad of such a guy is. And for this, let me state the following proposition. Uh, so, in fact, uh, it falls on the following generality that if you have H in some GLN QP, a uh, closed subgroup, So for example, G of QP for any linear group G, or an open subgroup thereof, or whatever, <coughs> then you can <coughs> try to understand what this D8 of the point mod H is. And so the proposition is that The d at of the point mod h the coefficients in lambda is really just the derived category <coughs> of smooth h representations on lambda modules. The RER was late. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As usual. As usual. Uh, smooth H representations on lambda modules. <coughs> and under this equivalence, and with a fixed choice of hard measure. Uh, um, the idea duality gets identified with smooth duality. takes any pi and after to the homomorphisms from pi into lambda, but then you take the smooth part of this. <coughs> and then this passes to the derived category. I mean, this sounds very reasonable, but actually verifying this is a little bit uh, is some trouble. But okay, we can do it. Um, in particular, uh, the fact that you really get the smooth part here only is related to some finiteness results for the cohomology of smooth diamonds. So um, there is something hidden, some work hidden in the statement, also it somewhat looks. Very reasonable. Not true that the abelian categories are identified. Which abelian categories? I mean, this is not a priori um, the derived category of an abelian category, although somehow a posteriori it is here. Uh, because <coughs> here we are not in the setup where. So if this was some diamond, some locally spatial diamond, then this end has some finite cohomological dimension, then this dead would automatically be the derived category of a tau sheaves. But here we're not in this setup. In particular, sheaves on this are somehow, oh, somehow you have to make first find a smooth cover of this guy by a diamond and so on. I mean, I mean a priori unraveling what this really is, this is a bit of a trouble. Okay. Uh, anyway, once you've checked this, uh, you find that in particular, if you try to understand what reflexive sheaves are, then those are the ones where passing to the double dual and double smooth dual is an isomorphism. So, um, uh, 
So it's reflexive if and only if for i and z I locate h i of f at a somewhat geometric point, which then becomes a representation of uh -huh, h. Uh, is admissible. Um, that's because you can translate to the same question about smooth representations. Um, and this functor is exact, so uh, understanding the radial duality, you can understand it in each degree individually. <coughs> and then the condition that the double smooth dual is the same thing means that on all the finite dimensions, I mean, all the, all the fixed factors under open subgroups, it must be finite dimensional. It must be reflexive lambda module, which means it's finite. <coughs> There is no restriction on degrees. There's no restriction on degrees, right? Yeah. <coughs> okay. So uh, that's good. What did I want to say next? Ah, so that that somehow deals with the uh, uh, the same as stable locus. Okay, so so now for so so finishes semi-stable case. Uh, so now we need to so for the induction. Let's fix some. B and B of G, not same as stable, not basic. And so then we have this inclusion from some B bungee, which is less than B, into bungee, which is less or equal to B. And that may also already gives an, a name to the complementary closed. So we have some I bungee B, uh, meaning equal to B. <coughs> and so <coughs> we assume that the theorem is known that, I mean, really the obvious variant of the theorem for bungee less than B. <coughs> okay, so um, <coughs> so what do I have to do? Um, so we need to prove the following results. One is a finiteness result. <coughs> um, which says the following. So assume you have some f which lives on uh, bungee less than b. It's reflexive. Then if I take, push this forward to the whole guy and then restrict to the new closed stratum, so then I get a sheaf on bungee equal to B. Lambda, and we need to know that this is still reflexive. And you know that it is a tal in D a tal by general single experiment oh. No, because all functors are by definition functors on D a tal. 
Ah, so you modify them to be digital if they are... Right, for non-phasic compact immersions, I said that I define this RJ lower star to be the adjoint of J upper star. So RJ lower star, if I did it on V sheaves, would not lie in the D tau, but I just uh, reflect it back into the D tau by, by using the right adjoint to the inclusion. This means it's complicated to calculate it. It means it's complicated to calculate it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But you must do it this way. Um, <coughs> but it still commutes with smooth space change. I mean, if all right. um, and the second thing you need to prove is a duality result. Uh, so again, if f lies on this d at all on g, less than b, and that is reflexive. Okay, formally, uh, the statements look very similar now, but I will try to explain that the first thing really is a finiteness result, whereas the second thing is some kind of local duality result. <coughs> um, that will become, I think, clearer uh, when I go into the proofs. <coughs> so why is this what we want to know? So... That's why... Does this imply, why does this give the induction step? <coughs> well, you already understand reflexive sheaves on the two strata. So we understand reflexive sheaves on the strata. Bungie less than B by induction. And <coughs> uh, this bungee equal to B is this um, point modulus this group, <coughs> which are these kind of automorphisms of EB, where this was an extension of this periodic group. GB of QP by a connected group. <coughs> and so you can prove the usual thing that connected groups don't actually interfere with the allotic sheaf theory. So actually the D et al on this bungee equal to B lambda is equivalent to D et al of just the point mod GB of QP lambda. <coughs> and <coughs> so this means that uh, on the stratum you again can apply the result that says that these are given by smooth representation. Do you need a connected group as no Homology or something? Right, it's a connected group has no other cohomology. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, connected, kind of some kind of unipotent group, yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah, so it has no cohomology. Yeah. I mean you, don't you don't use the semi direct product structure, you just need an extension. Do I need the same direct product structure? I would think I just need an extension. Uh, okay. I have a same direct product in case I need it, but okay. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so do, 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 do. so we understand on the strata. Um, so then, say, uh, for the theorem, we need to prove two directions. So uh, which direction should I do first? Uh, so assume first that say G in D et al bound G less or equal to B lambda <coughs> has admissible stalks in the sense of the theorem. <coughs> and then we have a triangle. Like so. <coughs> and this is reflexive by induction. And then the whole thing is reflexive by two. <coughs> uh, this is reflexive um, of by the case of one g equal to b. And then the whole thing is reflexive as i is proper. It's a closed immersion. And we had seen that inclusions by proper maps preserve reflexivity. And so <coughs> extensions of reflexive sheaves are reflexive, and so we see that g is reflexive. And so conversely, assume that G is reflexive. <coughs> uh, or maybe, <coughs> uh, okay, so what do we want to see? We want to see it has uh, good stalks, right? And so, ah, so what? So you do the same thing. You do the same thing. So the left thing. Uh, so okay. So uh, same exact sequence. implies that this thing is reflexive. <coughs> the same triangle. And, uh, but then because this is in a closed immersion, this actually implies that I upper stuff G is reflexive. And so uh, we see. Uh, it's good stuff. I mean, so <coughs> on the open part, uh, we already know that it must have good stalks, admissible stalks. So, admissible stalks for induction. <coughs> and so this means uh, it has admissible stalks. So for the argument, the finiteness didn't quite appear, but it will be a step in getting to the duality. But so because of this uh, identification of reflexive sheaves here again with admissible representations of the J JB of QP, uh, this statement about this reflexivity is really just saying that something is an admissible representation. So in this sense, it's really a finiteness result. <coughs> Whereas this reflexivity on this uh, stack here is a much more geometric statement. It's much more like an actual duality statement, Poincaré duality. Uh, 
Okay. And so, uh, right. I think I'm on the wrong page here. Uh, so, we want to do these things, and for this, we use a chart so, uh, to compute anything. Usage charts. This is MB, which was an MB tilde mod G of GP. Why uh, some pi B? Um, And so where MB, so B, so uh, I said this somewhere, but let me now make say it explicitly again. I assume that G is quasi for simplicity. Um, so then B is actually the image of some BM, BM basic, where m is contained in p, is contained in g, so there's a levy, and this is a parabolic encoding some slope filtration. <coughs> and what is mb tilde? Uh, that classifies p torsors e plus an isomorphism of the reduction to m with the bundle corresponding to this basic element. Uh, then this maps via a GB of QP, which is the same thing as a MBM QP torso <coughs> to MB, which is a set of P torsos. E is such that E times PM is fiber-wise isomorphic. Is point-wise isomorphic. To the N. <coughs> and then this maps to bungee E while sending E to the push out. And <coughs> uh, the conjecture, which is this conjecture that explains the star, its main theorem, is that this map from MB to Bungie is equal to B, which is open to Bungie, uh, is Elkhorn logically smooth. <coughs> and we can prove this for GLN. And MB itself is also MCO. And MB itself is also uh, a smooth out instead. Yeah. As a consequence, some of I mean, because the map is smooth and Bungie itself is smooth, this guy needs to be smooth. <coughs> but you can, this is actually unconjectural, so you can directly show that this is smooth. Um, Okay, so so now we have the following diagram that this maps to this bungee is equal to b um, with some j tilde. Let's call this j prime here actually. Um,
the preimage here I will denote by mc mb circ. Um, here you have i and gb. Uh, let's call this i prime. Uh, what you get here is a fiber is actually just a point modulo uh, gb of qp. So effectively, what you're doing over the stratum is you fix a splitting of the harder narrow Zimmer filtration. And then you get this as the automorphism group. <coughs> and you also have on top of this a similar diagram. Uh, uh, I call this point XB. It's just a copy of spark K. The open start to middle is on the left and the closed start to on the right. <laughs> Is that conflicting with standard usage? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is the open part, this is the closed part. Yeah. I mean, I use I and J in the usual way, I think. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, we have this picture. <coughs> and so um, <coughs> let's start with the finiteness. <coughs> so, by using the conjecture, smooth space change plus some unraveling of the formalism, uh, uh, plus um, why well, is this part of the unraveling of the formalism? That this mb tilde is some kind of strictly Hanselian space. <coughs> so it behaves a little bit like power series over an algebraically closed field. Um, you what you can prove is the following, that if you look at the sections on point mod k, where I say k in GB of QP is an open pro P subgroup. Pro P just for simplicity, essentially, but makes things slightly easier. Um, ah, so, I mean, I fixed here my F and D et al. Bun G less than B lambda, and I should put the pullback under pi B here. <coughs> um. <coughs> so if I pull it back under pi B here, I get a sheaf here, and then whether I do push forward here and pull back here or upstairs, this doesn't matter. And so I want to understand what happens if I push forward here and pull back here. And then I want to know that there's an admissible representation here. So what I want to know is that these kinds of global sections, if I do go to the point mod k, uh, <coughs> that this is finite in each degree. <coughs> and you can compute this just as a cohomology of this open part mod k. So recall that mb tilde over mb was this torsor under this group, so you can particularly divide by this group. That's still some kind of stacky object, but anyway. Uh, with coefficients where this is still reflexive. <coughs> or a different way of writing the same thing is actually to write the cohomology of this guy. Let's call this pi b tilde if the star takes a k invariance. Where pi b tilde 
is the composite projection. Uh, not smooth. Uh, so <coughs> this description is better because here we still have a reflexive sheath. Uh, here we're pu pulling back too far, so it's not reflexive anymore. But what's nice about this formula is that it tells you that it's actually um, if you do this thing, you push forward and you pull back, and you know that what you get is just some smooth representation of this group JB of QP. The smooth representation is just this thing here, because we've identified the k invariance for any k with the k invariance here. <coughs> so what you want to prove really is that this, is that this cohomology here is an admissible representation. Uh, of this group. What, what is the thing with the not smooth? You, are, you <coughs> have the conjecture that the map is smooth. Well, okay, mate. Well, pi, pi B is smooth, yeah. Not pi B tilde. Ah, so the, the torso is not smooth. Yeah, so uh, pro, pro, uh, project quotients under profinite group are not smooth uh, because profinite sets, the fibers are not smooth. Profinite sets are not smooth. There was this other thing that if you have something smooth and then you divide, then the quotient is still smooth over the base. But that's a different statement. Ah, okay, so the torsos and the profiles even T groups are not. No. Okay, so you, this gives you a way of computing what you want to compute. And so now we need to prove, so we need to show that this is finite. In each cohomological degree. And so this, uh, uh, there are two, two ingredients. So by the way, the, the, when you write K acting on this R gamma, this requires some foundation. So <laughs> the, in general, if a group acts on the top, it's, it's a non-discrete group acting on the top of, so you need some to know that it takes the other definition. Okay, so I will use two, two things. Well, actually, no. I claim that in each cohomology degree, the map is an injection. This I can just say. And the image will always be just the invariance. Forget about any topology of this group acting on this set. I mean, I think it's just. And is it also a coherent topos? So Everything inside is a. Okay, let me say what these objects are. So, um, the open part of this MB tilde um, <coughs> is actually a quasi compact separated spatial, well, spatial implies quasi compact, but diamond. Um, whereas this quotient here would again be a stack. Well, in this sense, this is nicer here. Um, and so this means that you can compute uh, um, cohomology. I also find it dimensional. Um, compute cohomology uh, as a direct limit of Czech cohomologies. Over 
finite uh, over covers, or it's all covers, with finitely many. <coughs> if it was not quasi-compact, then to do this, you would have to use infinitely many things. And then if you write down the chess complex, it has some infinite products, and they become very big. Um, <coughs> but if you use this information carefully... But why is it not hyper-covered cohomology? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's this thing that uh, f might be unbounded, but actually for this statement, you can reduce to the case where f is bounded, because you know by induction that canonical truncations preserve reflexivity. By induction, canonical truncations preserve reflexivity because the condition of being reflexive is a condition of cohomology sheaves. And so this means, and uh, each individual cohomology group of this guy by some finite dimensionality only depends on some bounded piece of the complex. So you can reduce to the case where this is actually just a sheaf, in which case you are allowed to just use the direct limit of usual Chesh cohomology. No, no, but I'm saying on if there is a result. On the coherent topos, the cohomology is computed in general by hypercover and not by. Okay. If you want, you can also do hyper. Yeah. No, I do <coughs> you have an analog of Artin's theorem on joints of Hensel ring that allow you to do check cohomology, or you are not. Uh, so maybe, yeah, so maybe. Let's say hyper. Over, it's all hyper covered. But still, we'll finally many terms in each degree. Yeah? <coughs> um, and also you know that this f sheaf f is not too big for example it has countable dimensional stalks and then you have to sit down and do it carefully but it implies that uh, all the cohomology groups they are at most countable So in particular, you have to check that there are not too many etal things and so on. <coughs> but the critical part that ev makes everything work is the quasi complexity here. <coughs> so you have a cofinal, accountable cofinal system. Yeah, you have a countable cofinal system of such guys. Yeah. I think so. Um, and then the second thing is uh, you apply Poincaré duality. So because f is reflexive, so in particular it's a dual of something else, of some f prime. <coughs> and then this implies that actually the cohomology of this guy with coefficients in this guy um, is a dual well, the R home of the compact support cohomology of this guy uh, of the thing of which is, is a dual of into lambda. And Ofer will again complain because um, I'm using here a complex support cohomology for something which is not representable. The way to get around this issue is to not try to do this directly for the projection absolutely, but for the map to the point mod k, and then you use uh, the description of sheaves on the point mod k. So you can justify this. Uh, but this means that Actually, the cohomology is a dual space.
Right, and then I mean, if you have something, the dual space which is countable, then must be finite. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> one can also do this argument in slight variance, so one doesn't need this countability here, but argues slightly differently. But then you need that everything is stable under pullback to pull finite sets. But anyway, so <coughs> that's the essential idea that on the one hand it's automatically dual, and on the other hand, by this quasi compacity, it's somehow more of a direct limit nature. And so uh, playing these off against each other implies finiteness. <coughs> All right. And so, uh, the other part is reflexivity, so duality. <coughs> so again, we start with RF, which lives on this less MB part, uh, and this reflexive. And we want to prove uh, that the extension by zero. So uh, let's try to unravel what this means. So what is the dual of J lower shriek? Well, by the general formalism, that's R J lower star of the dual. <coughs> and so um, and <coughs> so we have an exact, we have a triangle that J lower shriek of the dual of F maps to R J lower star of the dual of F maps to um, <coughs> the stuff concentrated at the point for the push forward. And so, by the way, this is a step that will become clear in a second. Why we really already need to know that this kind of gadget here is finite. To know that this extra. <coughs> this extra term that we get here is not too big. <coughs> and then we apply duality again. So then, first of all, the order of the terms change. And so, OK, so here in the middle, we get the double dual of f, which is a dual, dual of f. <coughs> what do we get on the right? On the right, we get the dual of this guy. The dual again turns the J lower shriek into the RJ lower star. And then we get it off the double dual, but that's just RJ lower star of F. Uh, 
I hope I'm doing this right. And so then <coughs> here the duality commutes with the I lower star. And so what we get here is the I lower star of the dual of the sky. And we have our natural map here from J. Washburn. Let's call this map star. Yeah. Okay, so what is clear is that if I pull back this map under J, then this is an isomorphism. <coughs> For example, because then this term vanishes, this term will be F again. This map is an isomorphism, this map is an isomorphism, then this map is. <coughs> So it remains to check it on the complementary closed. So I up I stuff. <coughs> but if I pull this back under I, then it's zero, because I took the extension by zero. So I need to prove that this is zero if I pull it back under I. So in other words, I need to prove that these two things become isomorphic after I pull back under I. Uh, it was a shift. Equivalently, uh, if I do this, the yeah, upper star, then it's isomorphic to the dual of what I was getting for the dual sheaf. Shifted by one. <coughs> Which is some kind of local from gray duality. And let me actually uh, go one step further, and then we have to break. Um, <coughs> in the proof of finiteness, <coughs> we figured out how to compute <coughs> this procedure. Namely, instead we do it here, and then if we do it there, then the sections are given by these guys. So, going yet one step further, um, you have to prove the following, that for all k in GB of QP, an open for P subgroup. <coughs> the sections of This guy, so this is the left hand side, is isomorphic to the dual of the sections. some degree shifts so we write this. Uh, dual shifted by one. So 
So in other words, this is a Poincaré duality. Uh, on the stack, which is this open part modulo. You also need that the map is the correct map. Yeah. <coughs> and so, uh, let me say one last thing before the break. Um, if you want to prove the statement for potentially unbounded f, there's again a way to formally reduce to the case that f is concentrated in one degree. So we can assume that f is concentrated in one degree. Okay, and so then I will explain how to prove this after the break. So get out of the category, I have no bounds of your particles. No, there's no, it's not a bounded derived category, sorry. When you say D, it's already J. No, no, it's potentially unbounded. I mean, what you do in this case is that you uh, see that, hmm. ah. well, if you formulate the statement for the dual, then both statements take direct, filter direct limits to limits, and so you can reduce to the thing where you're bounded, cohomologically bounded above. <coughs> but then by some finite dimensionality, you can forget about stuff which is too far on the other side. And so anyway, you can do this. So we'll break for 15 minutes. Yeah. So maybe I should have uh, stressed that, I mean, there's one commutation of duality was J lower shriek, which is that it transforms J lower shriek into J lower star, but this other adjunction, one might know, is actually failed. So you, it's not in general true that this R J lower star would be taken by duality J lower shriek. That's what you want to prove. And it's some of us, for constructible sheaves, you know it's true, but only because you know by duality for constructible sheaves. Um, okay, so. Uh, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> This time it's not the R here. Okay. So, <coughs> actually, something slightly funny happens here with this Poincare duality. Namely, it's a Poincare duality where the pairing is an odd degree. So, let me actually uh, tell you about an analog. So, it is like a functional spectrum. Right, it's the analog of the punctured spectrum, exactly. So, uh, so I assume you have an A2 over a K, and you have the origin. <coughs> and uh, let's say M is a strict tensorization. of A2 at X. And then it has a closed stratum, which is X, and it has a punctured spectrum, and circ. And <coughs> then, well, if you are, get inspired by this, like the complex picture, okay, C, then <coughs> you would think that this is a very small neighborhood of this point, and so. It's like a three square, and then there is a coordinate which gives you the distance to, to x. And so this has a three dimensional point graduality. Because for cohomology, this factor doesn't matter. So that's the kind of Poincare radiality which we want to prove. So we have like the strict tensorization of our space at this point. And <coughs> then there's some homotopically trivial direction which gives you the distance to the origin. And then <coughs> you have some kind of Milner sphere around this point or whatever it's called, um, which is this compact manifold of one real dimension less. <coughs> Um, but now we do a trick, and so let me explain the trick uh, in this example first. So assume you have 
a self map, which is contracting towards zero. Uh, for example, in characteristic P, uh, you might take x, y goes to x to the P, y to the P. <coughs> and, <coughs> and assume it's actually an automorphism, so Let me also assume that f is an automorphism. Uh, so for example, after passing to the perfection. Perfectified. <coughs> which doesn't really matter as regards etal cohomology. So then, <coughs> um, what I can do is I can divide the punctured spectrum by f to the z. Uh, where you would imagine that in the analogous situation, what you're somehow doing is here is you're contracting uh, in regards to the distance, you're contracting to the origin. So the idea is that this is something like this, but then on this distance factor, you're somehow folding this together with multiplicative period p. So this would be in a three times as one. And this satisfies some four-dimensional Poincaré duality. Okay. And <coughs> um, one can. Uh, If one knows finiteness of cohomology for M circ, one can deduce the three dimensional duality uh, from the four dimensional duality. Circle mod f to the n times z, where n is sufficiently large. So the idea is that the cohomology of this quotient is some of the group cohomology of z acting on the cohomology here. But then, if n is sufficiently divisible, um, this if the cohomology is finite. This will actually act trivially on cohomology, and so the cohomology of this quotient will actually just be direct sum of two copies of the cohomology of m circ, <coughs> and then we can deduce the desired duality here. Manifold. And so in algebraic geometry, it's slightly tricky to uh, make this work. You can, I think, actually do something like this if you uh, replace the strict tensorization by this formal completion and then pass to eddic spaces. So then this M circ is some eddic space itself, and uh, you can make sense of this quotient and it will behave like a proper smooth object. Uh, and so you can also make sense of these objects uh, in our case. So what you do is the following. So in our situation, fix some kind of UP. It's called just called UP. It's an element of GB of QP, um, uh, which is central. But is some uh, hmm. Hmm. X was positive slope. On 
becomes a unipotent radical of P. So the, uh, let me just try to say an example of what I mean. Um, <coughs> so if G is GL2 and B corresponds to this bundle O of 1 plus O, then uh, GB is this levy, GL1 times GL1, sitting inside of uh, the Borel. <coughs> and then I look at the element P comma 1 in this guy. <coughs> okay, and so then uh, I can take the quotient by the action of UP. So the idea is that UP is such an operator as this F up there. Oh, I can take some power of it. Um, this is an analog of this operator F up there that is contracting uh, MB's tilde all towards the origin. And <coughs> but if you remove the origin, then it's acting freely. You can take the quotient, so the action is free. And now the map to the base is proper and smooth. Um, let me give you an example of what's happening here. Uh, in this GL2 example, still, um, what was this MB circ? I said last time that this was uh, the eddic spectrum of this Laurent series field modulo a profinite group. And it was a free action. And uh, so this is a quasi compact space, but the map to the point is not quasi compact because whenever I base change this to some non Archimedean field, uh, it becomes a punctured open unit disk, modulo profinite group. Uh, but um, in these coordinates, UP corresponds to the map which takes T to T to the P. And so if I take this guy uh, mod UP to the Z, Then it's this guy modulo for Venus to the Z, and then also modulo for finite group. But this, forget about this profinite group, it's not the important part of what I'm trying to say. Um, <coughs> so you get this quotient. And so, again, there's this crucial difference of perspectives between looking at these just as a diamond or looking at the structure morphism. If you look at this just as an object, this is very bad. It's not quasi-separated. <coughs> well, just a sheaf on the, on the perfectoid space and characteristic P. It's not quasi-separated because 
if you take a quasi-compact object over it, like this edX spectrum, and then takes a fiber product, you get z many copies of it, because you're dividing by the z actor. But if you look at it relatively, No, it's still quasi-compact, but not quasi-separated. Um, but this map is wonderful. It's quasi-compact, quasi-separated. It's even proper and smooth. So it's relatively represented by... Uh, it's relatively represented by diamonds, by proper and smooth guys. Because whenever you base change the picture to an algebraically closed field, uh, what you get is a punctured open unit disk modulus the action of Frobenius, which is a wonderful object. So, of the base change to some sparse C, I get punctured open unit disk modulus Frobenius. Modulus profile group. <coughs> And so, and this is a wonderfully nice object. <coughs> All right. And so, uh, and because it is proper and smooth, we can apply Pronko duality on this space. So, if you then just use a formalism, plus uh, our assumption that f is reflexive. We, can we get this kind of even dimensional Pronker duality. On on this stack. And then, <coughs> okay, let me write the argument down again. Let's say you need the compatibility in the end. You get some for graduality and you need compatibility with the map that you got from. Yes, there is to check some compatibility of maps. Um, uh, but uh, so if n is sufficiently divisible, uh, the cohomology of this quotient and uh, let's pull back here uh, is the same as. I mean, uh, up to the nz acts trivially on the cohomology of this guy uh, by finiteness. Because if you have any automorphism of a finite object, then some big power of it will be trivial. And then, once this happens, uh, this means that the cohomology, by some uh, hochstedt spectral sequence, the cohomology of this quotient is just two copies of the cohomology of this guy. So you have, you have got the spectral sequence. But then you need to know that it is. Uh, I mean, it acts trivially uh, some in, in the derived category. Okay. I want that the action is trivially in the derived category, and then I think it really splits as a direct sign. And okay, and then you need to check that the even-dimensional Poincaré duality, which you get on this space, really comes from two odd-dimensional Poincaré dualities. Uh, 
relating this with the dual of this and the other way around. All right. So that's what I wanted to say about the proof of the main theorem. OK, so uh, let me make some concluding remarks about uh, uh, a few things that one can deduce from the formalism. So this is somehow continuing the discussion uh, of the first half of the first lecture. And for this, I would like to pass to LRD coefficients. And so give me some kind of, let me give you some kind of uh, I don't want to claim that I can make sense of this in as good a way as would be desirable, but you can make sense of some objects. So you can just make sense of uh, some due reflexive bungee with OE coefficients. That's essentially by passing to the limit uh, of the story modulo powers of L. So if you would have done everything in infinity categories, you could literally pass to the limit. Um, there's a way to do it without infinity categories. Um, then I can just formally set And so there's also no, some of this is a canonical object that uh, where any possible definition would give you, reasonable definition should give you the same answer in the end. So then for the next thing, that's not true. Okay. Um, I define this with E coefficients to be just the idempotent completion. No, but the, the, there is a problem in the limit process because then you go from OE modulo powers of L to. I don't want to do this just on the derived category. Yeah? I don't take a limit of derived categories. If I do a limit, I do it of infinity categories. No, no, but I'm saying that that because of infinitely many cohomology groups and infinite total dimension, when you pass from OE mod L to them to OE mod L to the smaller power, okay. you, you don't necessarily go from a reflexive guy to a reflexive guy when you take mod when you pass from one ring to another because you have infinitely many possible cohomologies at the given level mm, yes. and then you take toes with a smaller ring and you can have many things on the left and on the right and then you, you will have many toes that so you get possibly will okay so, so you, you can work with bounded maybe in a flexible mm, uh, bounded let me do bounded um okay and maybe I also want, oh. <laughs> okay, the so idempotent completion of uh, the thing tensor with E. And then I don't claim that this satisfies any kind of descent anymore. So, or that you can check. Yeah, I mean, this is some kind of not good thing, maybe, but.
And you need the item for the completion. You don't need your. <coughs> yeah, let me do the item for the completion because I might want to um, use some operators, some excursion operators to cut, uh, to cut an object into pieces. So I do want an item potent completion. But is it necessary? Is it? Uh, you, you ask, but mm, yeah, I think it's necessary. I think. Because for DPC of nice. No, because. Schemes, it's not necessary. To, to it's already item potent. That is, you any. No, but I would expect that you can have um, representations over OE of such periodic groups, which are somehow um, which have some congruences. But then generically they decompose, and then if you want to somehow get the decomposition that you have generically, if you want to get it integrally, I don't think you can do it. So, I think you need an antiposing completion there. Um, At least for the part of the drive category that I'm eventually interested in. I'm confident that this is easily defined. Um, <coughs> and so let's now fix an L parameter. Fix same or simple L parameter. One can define a full subcategory. Uh, which is some of the phi part uh, of this guy. So there is also a question like in elastic shapes that you can have <laughs> no, for various eigenvalues which are not elastic uh, uh, units, then you need values. <coughs> I don't know if this occurs in this case. Well, I'm working over an algebraically closed field right now. So I right at the beginning, I fix an algebraically closed space field, and I'm working over the space field all the time. Oh, but this W of QP, so you have the... Ah, uh, yes. So it might be... Well, I can define this for anything. It might be that it's just empty. But I mean, this whale group, it's not related to... Uh, the fact that this whale group appears here has nothing to do with this algebraically closed space field that I had. Yeah, well, I'm asking if the Frobenius element is not kind of not elastic uh, unit. So yeah, so it, it's probably true that if I have a guy here whose image is not compact in some sense, uh, then what I'm de just defining just now will be empty. But I can just still define it, okay? <laughs> LG is a Langland's dual, right? LG is a Langland's dual, yeah. yeah. Uh, I part. Um, um, by the condition that all excursion operators, as I defined them in the first lecture, are given by phi, or are determined by phi. And so, uh, let me discuss what one, what, what, what one would expect about this category. Uh, so, let me assume that this phi is actually cuspidal. So, assume that the group S phi, which is a centralizer in the dual group of phi, is finite. 
size cost per dollar. This implicitly also says that G is, uh, well, the central torus has no split part. Uh, okay, so GLM would be disallowed for, for this state. G hat uh, is a dual group. So LG is the same direct product of G hat with a real group. I guess. So, in this case, you would expect, and these expectations are results that uh, I would believe to be within reach, okay? Um, you would expect that all these reflexive guys in this component are concentrated on the same stable locus. So actually, um, what this guy is, this lump, uh, QL bar, Part. It should just be a direct. Well, it doesn't matter, there's only finite number. So, under this assumption, it's automatically true that there are only finitely many basic elements, only finitely many connected components. Um, the direct sum over all basic B. Uh, of the derived category of derived category with admissible cohomologies um, of this group JB of QP, of the, all these inner forms. And then you take a phi part of that in the sense that you only allow those admissible representations, all of whose constituents have this fixed L parameter phi. where the L parameter is as defined in the first lecture. So this means that this thing, which is a priori defined in terms of some very complicated geometry, boils down to some very concrete representation theory. Why would I expect that this can be proved? So if you would have a sheaf which has this L parameter but lives on some other stratum, then this other stratum is given by an inner the automorphism group there is an inner form of a levy. And you would expect that if you have representation of an inner form of a levy, that then the associated L parameter should be induced, which is ruled out by this class fidelity condition. So you would only have to prove some compatibility with parabolic induction to get this statement. And so that's the first expectation you would have. And the second expectation you would have is that uh, all hacker operators are T exact for the standard T structure. That is not perverse, but... but uh, well, it doesn't really matter, right? Because these are just... We just have points here. So the perverse is the same as the usual T-structure. Ah, but you are speaking about uh, just... Well, on this part, and on this part, some of the perverse and the usual T-structure are the same, so... Um, it's certainly not true that hack operators are... Uh, except for any kind of T-structure on the full derived case. You need to make some assumption. 
and for these cusp flow parameters, oh, doesn't matter which one we take. And so we would actually this way get a, an action. Um, but was perverse ever defined? Actually? Perverse was never defined anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so there were talks about something that's not this. defined. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, everything is a little <laughs> undefined, maybe. But let me try to explain this picture. Um, so you actually get some kind of action uh, where you have here the algebraic representations of the L group. Mm. Times, uh, okay, let me call C, the category for phi, to be the direct sum of all B and B of G basic. So category of admissible QL bar representations of G B of QP takes a phi part. So it's some kind of representation theoretic category attached to this cuspital parameter phi. And so this would mean that whenever you have a representation of the L group, you can act on this category and you get another object of this category, but actually you get an object with a veil group action. Oops. Was it? And the actions continues. Okay. Uh, and this action satisfies some conditions. Mm -hmm. Objects of CP together with the action of W. Right. right. So continuous means uh, uh, that it's like in a, in a smooth representation that it's right. That every vector is an open stable. Right. Every vector is an open stable value. Yeah. Well, a priori, they might that might intertwine the analytic action, the analytic part of the veil group with uh, the analytic topology of the SQL bar. It will actually not happen. Um, and so, um, this gives you some purely category theoretic uh, setup here, where you have a category, you have some category of representations of an algebraic group acting on it, where after you act, you get an extra action of some other group and satisfying some compatibilities. And you can write down all the structure there is. And then there's the following theorem, uh, which seems to be well known to the experts in geometric Langlands. So for example, Gates, Gurry, and Vincent Lafork and so on, they seem to know this. Um, uh, it seems to be well known, but anyway, uh, Somebody who actually wrote down a proof that I understood is Johannes Anschutz. Um, <coughs> so, uh, yeah, so assume that S phi is finite, yeah? Oops, editing new blackboard, I guess. Then there is actually an of the tensor category of representations of the centralizer group as phi. Uh, on this corresponding isotopic component. Uh, 
which on <coughs> under these assumptions, uh, under these expectations, would actually be an action on this category uh, C phi. Um, such that uh, the action up there actually this action is unique if you write down correctly all the compatibilities uh, uh, given by the following procedure. So if you have a representation of the L group, so in particular, uh, you get a representation of S phi times the veil group. Because you can restrict uh, via phi to a, a representation of the veil group, but then uh, this action of the veil group commutes with S phi by the definition of S phi. So you get a representation of the product group. Uh, so which is the same thing as representations of S phi, which are veil QP equivariant. And then if you have a representation of QL bar, or S phi, then you have this action, so you get an endomorphism of this reflexive subcategory. So what do you mean by action of the tensor category? Just uh, on the usual derived category, or there is some higher? No, no, on the usual derived category, just on the category. Okay. So this means there is some uh, there are isomorphisms <laughs> and some compatibilities. Right. So for every object, you get an endomorphism. And when you have two objects, then the action of the tensor product is the composite of the actions. And when you have three, you have a query. And when you have three, you have a compatibility. But it's only on the drive category, so it just stops at some point. OK. Yeah. Uh, let me not try to remember at which point. Um, Okay, so this means <coughs> that you can describe the action of the L group actually uh, in terms of the action of this S phi and the L parameter. And so this actually, uh, if you do unravel what this means, this is a form of the Kotwitz conjecture. So this uh, action of the representations of the L group this encodes the cohomology of Rappaport zinc spaces and then you take isotopic components under uh, some guys in this phi part. And then this computes the output of this functor in terms of uh, the action of this category of representations of S phi, which is doing some combinatorial thing like realizing some Jackie Langdon's correspondences. It takes one uh, representation with L parameter phi and produces another representation. So this uh, gives you the representation theoretic part of the picture. And then it also tells you how the veil group acts, namely, well, it's also given by this procedure. This is a form of Kotwitz's conjecture on the cohomology. of basic robots and spaces. Well, this is a form of the Kotwitz conjecture, except that uh, it doesn't really tell you what this action is. So proving the Kotwitz conjecture would then come down to actually understanding what this action is. So let me say one last word about this. Uh, 
And so there's the following conjecture, uh, which in this, well, which is essentially due to Kaleta, except, uh, of course, he didn't have this formalism to state it. But Kaleta, Kaleta uh, conjectured exactly how this category C phi or the irreducible objects of C phi look like. Um, okay, so as, let me assume for this that G is quasi split. So then what Kaleta effectively conjectures is that this category C phi is equivalent to the category of representations of S phi. Where here's a trivial representation gets mapped to use a unique generic representation ah, and fix the Whittaker data. Unique generic representation of G of QP, which is the one which corresponds to a trivial element. And then, uh, in general, he has a way to parameterize all the irreducible representations of all these, what he calls extended pure inner forms, all these JB of QPs. And they should be given by certain representations of S phi, which have a certain behavior. Um, and, well, if you combine this over all possible different Bs, then they should be parameterized by all possible irreducible representations of the S phi. And so he relates irreducible objects on both sides, but actually this should be an equivalence of categories. And, and this should also be true. Uh, what, what did you write? G Q P equal what? G one of Q P. So I mean, if you take for B the trivial element, so then. Yeah. Uh, compatibly with say wrapper is fine. So in other words. There should be this unique generic representation. And then this action of the representation of S phi would give you a whole functor from the category of representations of S phi into here. And this should be an equivalence. But so this isomorphism, it depends on the choice of Whittaker datum. But some of the action of the representations of S phi on it, they do not don't depend on the choice of Whittaker datum. Um, the unique rep generic representation here. So some of the basis element here depends on the choice of a Whittaker datum, but this kind of module structure over the representation of S phi do not depend on it. So some base point free version of this conjecture is somehow that this category is somehow free of rank one over the representations of S phi. Okay, and uh, what Kaleta really um, made much more precise is the, um, he said, uh, he uh, wrote down some explicit endoscopic character relations uh, for this action. Uh, expected endoscopic. And so this is actually also something that seems to be in, in reach. So there is work in progress. Of Kaleta and Weinstein. Where they use the left shed trace formula. And check that it is compatible. And check. That's a bungee picture. Is compatible with these endoscopic character relations.
So the way they phrase the argument is that they assume that Carleta's conjecture is known in his form, that um, the reducible objects are paired in the expected way and satisfy the expected endoscopic character relations, which Carleta has proved in a wide variety of cases. And then they prove that uh, what you see in the cohomology of these basic robot zinc spaces really is realizing this correspondence of representations. Uh, and so let me just say that this generalizes uh, work of Faltings and Strau for the limitate case. Um, or FARC for uh, some unitary groups. FARC and unitary groups. I think U1, N minus 1, right? And uh, also Mieda had some results of GS for GSP4, I believe. So there are Faltings and Schrauf proved by some purely local methods using the left shift trace formula on Lubin Tate or Drinfeld Tower. Is that in the cohomology of these Lubin Tate spaces, you realize the Jackie Langlands correspondence. And this is some large generalization of this. And so, my time is up, sorry. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Very nice lectures. Yes. Are there any questions or comments? I mean, in this middle back book, yeah. of course, there's also the action of the Deer group, right? <laughs> Whereas in the lower blackboard, there's no action of the Deer group, right? Well, some of this theorem uh, tells you that the action of the veil group is already as expected. And everything comes down to determining what happens on the, for the periodic groups. And for example, for the Lubin Tate Tower, uh, which you can't quite apply, so if you do PGL or something, uh, or prove a version of the theorem which allows the center. Um, the theorem would already tell you that if you plug in some super cusp representation of GLN, what you get is some representation of the division algebra tensor with the correct L parameter. And then if you combine this, or oh, tensor with the L parameter that is defined by these methods. Um, if you combine this with Faltings and Strauch paper, which tell you that you see the correct Jackie Langlands correspondence, you basically see that you get the correct thing. But actually, the output of this is that actually what you see here in this picture is really the usual local language correspondence. No, but I mean, are you using some global thing to determine this? No, this is purely local this argument. But I'm using that uh, there is a local characterization of local language for GLN. That is what's realized in Zubin Tate Tower. Well, I mean, when yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that it is a local language correspondence is proved by global methods. Other questions? So if not, let's thank people again.